Welcome to Club 200. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thank you. more people for coming in uh, as the night goes on. It's a pleasure to introduce the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, Justice Michael Moldaver attended the University of Toronto where he earned a Bachelor of Arts in 1968 and a Bachelor of Laws in 1971 where he was a gold medalist. Justice Moldaver articled with the law firm of Thompson Rogers and was called to the Ontario Bar in 1973. He was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1985 while in practice, Justice Moldaver was director of the Criminal Lawyers Association, director of the Advocates Society, and co-chair of the University of Toronto Academic Tribunal, discipline subsection. He began his judicial career as a member of the High Court of Justice for Ontario, where he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Ontario on April 20, 1990. He was elevated to the Court of Appeal for Ontario on December 22, 1985, and to the Supreme Court of Canada in October 2011. Throughout his career, Justice Moldaver has played an active role in the legal community. From 1978 to 1995, he co-taught criminal law courses at Osgoode Hall Law School and the University of Toronto Law School. I'm sure I can go on for hours because it's quite an impressive resume, but then without further ado, Justice Moldaver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that kind of introduction. Actually, you know, when you run through the judicial career, it's indicative of the fact, you know, trial judge, court of appeals, Supreme Court of Canada, I just can't keep a job. <laughs> 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 Anyways, thanks so much for inviting me, Rabbi Arsky, to be with you uh, again tonight. Uh, for those of you who may not know it, uh, Rabbi Arsky is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, after speaking at a similar event about a year ago, uh, the rabbi kindly began asking me to return, and I respectfully kept saying no. And this went on for some time, but along the way, he started to send me treats. Hamantashen for Purim, matzah for Pesach, chalas for Rosh Hashanah, Shabbat, and gradles and gels for Hanukkah. Brother. It got so bad, actually, at one point, the Chief Justice approached me and wanted to know where all the goodies were coming from. <laughs> and whether I was accepting bribes. <laughs> when I explained the situation, she agreed to let me off the hook on one condition. She made me promise that I would share some of the Robinson Scala with her on the next delivery. She's still waiting. Right? <laughs> I'll be there on Friday. <laughs> OK, so we'll get going. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, uh, I hope you'll find the subject interesting. Last year, um, I went to Israel, had the good fortune to go to Israel with a delegation from our court. There were four of us that went from our court, including the Chief Justice. And the idea was to meet with the judges of the Israeli Supreme Court. And we did that, and we spent a wonderful few days together, uh, including several occasions in which we sat down and discussed uh, legal issues and problems uh, of mutual interest. And one of our discussions centered around the topic of judging in a multicultural society. And I found it interesting, and I thought it might be of interest to you, particularly those of you who are in law school and just waiting for the opportunity to become judges yourselves looking at YouTube. Now look, as some of you may know, judging in a multicultural society has many dimensions and it poses many challenges. I would be hard pressed to define its essence in a single sense. But if pushed, I might suggest in my own simplistic way that it can be distilled into the following three fundamental precepts. One, treating people equally before and under the law. Two, respecting the worth and dignity of every human being. And three, recognizing that in the main, diversity is a good thing and it serves to strengthen the fabric of our society and the robustness of our constitutional democracy. 
Now I could stop there because the rest is really just commentary, but I thought I would share three aspects of judging in a multicultural society uh, that uh, I think are, are pertinent and, and relevant uh, perhaps to you. The first is understanding, the second is redressing historical wrongs, and the third is balancing confi conflicting beliefs and values. So let me begin with understanding and the self-evident observation that a multicultural society cannot function if people from different cultures and backgrounds are unable to understand each other. The story of the Tower of Babel attests to this, with chaos being the end product. In its most literal sense, so far as the justice system is concerned, understanding means providing adequate translation and interpretation so that everyone can access our courts. That basic measure of understanding is enshrined in our Constitution. Section 14 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the right to an interpreter where a party or witness is deaf or does not speak the language of the proceedings. The first Supreme Court case interpreting Section 14 recognized the important link between the multicultural nature of our society and this right to an interpreter. The court observed that, and I quote, insofar as a multicultural heritage is necessarily a multilingual one, it follows that a multicultural society can only be preserved and fostered if those who speak languages other than English and French are given real and substantive access to the justice system. And to that end, the Supreme Court has laid down a constitutional minimum for interpretation. It must be continuous, precise, impartial, competent, and contemporaneous. Now another vital aspect of linguistic understanding in our justice system stems from our French and English heritage. And the important role that French language rights play, not just in the province of Quebec, but throughout Canada as a whole. While Canada is a multicultural nation, we are officially a bilingual country. Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms offers extensive protection for French and English language minorities. Most of these are uncontroversial. French and English have equal status in our federal parliament, for example. Every Canadian has the right to use French or English when they receive services from the federal government and when they appear before certain courts, including the Supreme Court. One area where the law is still developing is under Section 23 of the Charter. That provision protects the rights of English-speaking minorities in Quebec and French-speaking minorities in the rest of Canada to have their children receive education in their mother tongue. Our courts are called upon to make this right meaningful and to ensure, for example, that a province outside of Quebec, Francophone schools have equivalent facilities <coughs> and resources as the schools attended by English speaking, by the English speaking majority. Manifestly, linguistic understanding is vital to the existence and proper functioning of our multicultural society. That is a relatively easy uh, concept uh, to grasp. As judges, however, we bear the more difficult and subtle responsibility to ensure a deeper understanding between members of diverse communities. Failure to do so risks turning our courtroom into places of confusion, disrespect, and injustice. By way of example, Rupert Ross, a retired Crown Attorney, has worked, worked extensively with Aboriginal communities in Northern Ontario. His book, which is called Dancing with a Ghost, Exploring Indian Reality, 
offers compelling insights into cross-cultural understanding and misunderstanding. In his book, Mr. Ross describes learning from a First Nations elder that in some Aboriginal traditions, looking someone directly in the eye is rude and a sign of disrespect. Respect is shown by looking down or looking to the side with only the occasional eye contact to indicate attention. Without cultural understanding, it is apparent that this sign of respect can be mistaken for a sign of insincerity and evasion and lead to the rejection of testimony that is otherwise credible and reliable. Other examples abound. Some Aboriginal Aboriginals have an aversion to discussing their feelings and emotions with others. As such, they risk being labeled as unresponsive or uncaring or uncooperative. Labels that suggest a lack of remorse or low potential for rehabilitation simply because they experience discomfort in reflecting on their emotional state with a stranger. The consequences for sentencing are disturbing, to say the least. These are just some of the risks that we as judges must confront. And while our country is slowly making progress towards a more diverse change, judges do not share the same, often judges do not share the same background and cultural reference points as the people appearing before them. Understanding is possible, however, when we make a conscious effort to be sensitive to the lived realities of people from different backgrounds. In a speech on judging in a multicultural society presented by Chief Justice McLaughlin, the Chief Justice put the matter in these terms, and I quote, judges must practice conscious objectivity. By an act of imagination, they must seek to put themselves in the position of the person whose conduct they are judging and ask how things would appear from her perspective. They are not required to condone or approve, but they have a fundamental duty to understand. Now let me just turn briefly to regressing historical wrongs. Judging in a multicultural society means being conscious of our history. Judges in Canada are often called upon to participate in an ongoing conversation about how to deal with long-standing and legitimate grievances held by disaffected groups in our society. Slavery has often been described as America's darkest time, and its consequences are apparent to this day. In Canada, some feel our darkest time is the dispossession and marginal marginalization of our Aboriginal peoples. The detrimental impact of this historical wrong is widespread, and judges in our country must reckon with it. In our jurisprudence, we have sought where we can to be more responsive to the needs, perspectives, and unique challenges of our Aboriginal peoples who have long felt estranged from our justice system. The sentencing of Aboriginal offenders is one such area. In 1999, our court delivered the Watershed Gladue decision, which involved the interpretation of a criminal code provision instructing judges to pay, quote, particular attention to the circumstances of Aboriginal offenders, end quote, in the sentencing process. In giving this provision an expansive interpretation, the court highlighted the serious problem of Aboriginal overrepresentation in our prisons. It also acknowledged that excessive imprisonment of Aboriginal people is only the tip of the iceberg, and that widespread racism and systemic discrimination against Aboriginals has created a climate of deep mistrust and alienation. 
the court urged judges to be sensitive to the background factors that result in high crime and incarceration rates in the Aboriginal population, including such things as low income, high unemployment, lack of opportunities and options, lack of education, substance abuse, loneliness and community fragmentation, all of which can be traced to a long history of colonialism. And Gladden makes clear to do justice in a multicultural society, the judge must learn to be sensitive to the needs, challenges, and perspectives of marginalized groups. The task is even more crucial when a historical wrong cries out to be redressed. In Canada, our courts are learning, slowly but surely, how to grapple with the consequences of our difficult history, and in doing so, to advance the cause of justice. So finally, let me turn to the need to balance conflicting beliefs and values. The diversity that exists in Canada means that as judges, we are frequently called upon to accommodate individuals or groups who have differing and often conflicting beliefs. If we want our justice system to serve everyone equally, it is our duty to facilitate the participation of all citizens, regardless of their background or values. In theory, this is a straightforward idea, but in practice, it poses some of our greatest challenges. At some point, the beliefs of one group are bound to clash with the beliefs of another, and that is where we are called upon to mediate and reconcile these competing values to the best of our ability. This challenge affects many areas of our law. In the family law context, courts must reconcile our civil law with conflicting religious, uh, conflicting religious uh, uh, laws. And I could spend a little time talking to you about one case that came to our court, uh, Brucker and Markowitz, that involved a Jewish couple who at the time of separation had made a contract in which the husband had agreed to give his wife a gift. They finalized their divorce under Canadian law, but the husband then refused to grant the gift. The wife accordingly sued him for breach of contract. In defending the action, the husband claimed that he had the religious right not to grant the gift, and that any damages awarded against him would amount to punishment for him following his religious beliefs. In other words, Canadian law did not have the power to trump the moral dictates of his faith. To resolve the case, the majority of the court decided that it must balance the husband's claim to religious freedom against the wife's claim that his actions harmed her personally and undermined the values of Canadian society. Ultimately, the majority of the court upheld the trial judge's decision to grant the wife damages. In doing so, it noted that balancing these competing rights was a delicate exercise. And let me quote to you from the majority uh, judgment of the court delivered by none other than the Honorable Rosie Abella. Here's what she said. Not all differences are compatible with Canada's fundamental values, and accordingly, not all barriers to their expression are arbitrary. Determining when the assertion of a right based on a difference must yield to a more pressing public interest is a complex, nuanced, fact-specific exercise that defies right-line application. It is, at the same time, a delicate necessity for protecting the evolutionary integrity of both multiculturalism and public confidence in its importance. In the end, the court concluded, the majority of the court concluded that, and I quote again, the public interest in protecting equality rights, the dignity of Jewish women in their independent ability to divorce and remarry, 
as well as the public benefit in enforcing valid and binding contractual obligations are among the interests and values that outweigh the husband's claim that enforcing the contract for a gift would interfere with his religious freedom. Now that's an example from a family law, civil context. Let me give you something from a criminal law context. The, contract, the conflict between different beliefs also arises in the criminal code, in the criminal law. We see it sometimes in the context of the law of provocation. Under Canadian law, a successful defense of provocation will reduce a charge of murder to manslaughter. To establish the defense, the accused must show, among other things, that an ordinary person in his situation would have been provoked. This raises several difficult questions. For example, should we consider an ordinary person who shares the accused religious and cultural background? What if the accused belongs to a group that condones violence against women or holds racist or discrim discriminatory beliefs? We see this sometimes in the case of what are so-called honor killings, and whether an accused religious views on infidelity, male superiority, and family honor can inform the ordinary person's standard for the provocation defense. We had such a case when I was a judge on the Ontario Court of Appeal. In the end, we found it unnecessary to address the issue of provocation. However, in assessing it, one of my colleagues made the following important observation, and I quote, in this case, however, the appellant's religious and cultural beliefs are not the target of the alleged insult. insult. Rather, the appellant's religious and cultural beliefs are said to render the words spoken by the victim highly insulting. The difficult problem, as I see it, is that the alleged beliefs which give the insult added gravity are premised on the notion that women are inferior to men and that violence against women is in some circumstances accepted, if not encouraged. The case, by the way, involved a husband killing his wife uh, when he found out that she had been uh, unfaithful to him. Uh, my colleague carried on as follows. These beliefs are antithetical to fundamental Canadian values, including gender equality. It is arguable that as a matter of criminal law policy, the quote's ordinary person cannot be fixed with beliefs that are irreconcilable with fundamental Canadian values. Criminal law may simply not accept that a belief system which is contrary to those fundamental values should somehow provide the basis for a partial defense to murder, to which I said hallelujah. Some years later, the Supreme Court took up the matter. It recognized that an accused individual values and beliefs are relevant, but only to a point when considering the defense of provocation. The court stated as follows, the criminal law is concerned with setting standards of human behavior. The ordinary person standard must be informed by contemporary norms of behavior, including fundamental values such as the commitment to equality provided for in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There can be no place in this objective standard for antiquated beliefs such as, quotes, adultery is the highest invasion of property, quotes, nor indeed for any form of killing based on such inappropriate conceptualizations of, quotes, honor. Okay patient with me, you've suffered enough. I'm going to stop there and I hope it's given you a little bit of an understanding into the difficulties and problems that go with judging in a multicultural society. But uh, for those of you who think uh, schools have a think again, I'm not finished yet. Um, you're not going to get off the hook so I want to have a little fun, if I may, Rabbi. Have I got a few minutes to have a little fun? And uh, to that end, 
I hereby appoint all of you as judges of the Superior Court of Ontario for the next 10 or 15 minutes, okay? And I'm going to give you a set of facts that come from a real life case. It's called RVNS, otherwise known as the NECAS case. Let me give you a little bit about the facts, and then I'd like people to talk up and tell me how they would describe the case, and just give me a few brief reasons why. Not complicated, but here we go. NS is the complainant in a case of sexual assault. According to NS, she was repeatedly sexually abused as a child from the ages of 6 to 12 by her uncle and a cousin. When she was 15, NS revealed the assaults to a teacher at school, but NS's father intervened and deterred her from going to the police, and charges were not laid. In 2007, NS, who was then 30 years old and married, went herself to the police, and charges of sexual assault were laid against her uncle and cousin. By now, NS was a devout Muslim, and in conformity with her sincere religious beliefs, she wore a kneecap, which covered her entire face, except for her eyes. This is where you come in, you judges. This is where you come in. At court, NS requests permission from you to wear her kneecap while testifying. She tells you that if she is not allowed to keep her kneecap on, she will not be able to testify because it is impermissible for men, other than her husband and perhaps her father, to see her face. The defense objects to this and asks you to order NS to uncover her face. The defendants claim that their fair trial rights and their right to make full answer in defense will be compromised if they cannot see NS's face during her testimony. The defense also claims that courtrooms are public places, that criminal trials are public in nature, and that our values of openness and religious neutrality should trump NS's right to religious freedom, particularly in the context of a state-run trial. NS, on the other hand, claims that her right to religious freedom should take precedence, and that if she were ordered to remove her kneecap, she could not do so, and this would effectively deprive her of her right to access the courts and to have justice done in her case. Okay, judges. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Uh, should she uh, be allowed to keep her kneecap on, or should she be required to take it off? And just a few little brief remarks from anybody who's prepared to stand up and give me an answer as to why. Who thinks she should have to take it off? One, two. The rest of you think, no. <laughs> Probably a lot of you don't know yet, but who thinks she should be able to keep it on? Okay, we've got a few more that should be able to keep it on. Okay, so for those who say she should have to take it off, who would like to just talk up and give me a couple of reasons as to why she should have to remove it? Now, you're all judges now. <laughs> yeah. Um. The defense's actions are like, completely inexcusable, of course. You think you better stand up so everybody can hear, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so the defense's actions are completely inexcusable. But you have a situation where, at least in Canada and a lot of places, the accused has the right to a fair trial yep. and has the right to challenge the credibility of the, of the, um, the victim in okay. this case. So you have to kind of balance okay. um, whether she wants her if she wants her justice, she has to, in a way, conform to um, the values that are in society because we have a beyond reasonable doubt uh, threshold in, in criminal law. Right. The defense is, just has to disprove her credibility. 
So, I mean... The, the complaint, I take it, though, is you can't see your facial expressions. Well, yeah, that would be the issue, because if you can't see your facial expressions, how can you assess your credibility as, a, as an individual? So, okay. So... Well, not, don't sit down quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer, and that is certainly a uh, uh, position of we almost does it. I'm sorry? Two minutes? Okay, yeah. Um, so, so, in effect, I'm hearing that the defense has a right to see her face if she's coming into the courtroom to testify. It's not just that. They have a right to uh, to challenge the accusations against them. Right. If they can't challenge the accusations against them, then their liberty is going right. to be infringed. Well, they can cross-examine her all day long. They just can't see her face. Is that, is that the problem? Yeah, but seeing the face goes right to credibility. Right. So what if what if she what if she were burned and she had her face all bandaged and all you could see was her eyes? How do you think you'd do on a motion before the judge to say this person can't testify because we can't see their face? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd like yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a difficult balancing exercise because I agree. With I, you. I do believe that that victim has the right, their religious freedom, to, to keep the niqab on. But at the same time, you know, yeah. there's no easy answer. But what's the difference there? One is a physical disability. One is something that the, the witness cannot help. There's nothing yeah. he or she can do, right? With the bandaged face, there's nothing they can do. I mean, it's, it's a physical it, problem. I mean, if it's a... The other is a religious problem, right? Yeah, it was. Right. In both situations, I think it's a, it's a psychological... Um, impediment in a way, like in a way, like your religious uh, feelings are very much psychological, and how you feel and how right. you feel. So, so is one more mutable than the other? I don't know, I gotta shrug my shoulders. Even though charter rights are supposed to be equal? Again, shrugging the shoulders. That's why you're the judge. <laughs> <laughs> just take off just the kneecap yeah, once, so. it won't hurt you. Yeah. you know? Anyways, thank you. That's very good. You did a great job. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think she, first of all, by law, because of religious freedoms, it's kind of like reasonable accommodation, that there has to be a way for them to maybe accommodate her. Yeah. So that it's, at the same time, doesn't go against Canadian law, but at the same time, doesn't go against her religious freedom. Right. So, I mean, it might be far-fetched, I'm not a lawyer, but maybe have, let's say, when she testifies, having us only women present in the court, for example, so that she doesn't have to, in which case she can't take it off, and right. So how maybe the men leave the room for that? So there might be a way to accommodate them. Because it is a religion. I mean, it is technically a type of religious freedom. So. Right. That's a very good answer. And I mean, it's, it's got problems with it, obviously, especially with the jury trial. And so you'd only be restricted to picking female jurors, which might cause its own charter problems. Right? Yeah. yeah. And if there were male witnesses, I guess, or, sorry, if there were, if, if there were um, uh, the crown attorney was a, a guy, that would be a problem. But you could bring in a woman crown, right? Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. So bring in a woman defense counsel, even though, so then they challenged it on the basis that they didn't have counsel of their choice, which is another constitutional <laughs> right. It just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm to but but your, your point is we should do something to try and accommodate. Yes. And, if, and if we can, great. And if not, then what? Take it off? I, I don't think my position is. I think there will be about their way to come back home. Anybody worried about depriving someone ultimately of the act or access to our justice system because she won't uh, take it off and her religion really prevents her from doing that? So, sort of setting out a little model that says, if I wear a kneecap and I'm a devout Muslim, you can sexually assault you for free. 